Mike McClellan, welcome to Australian Musician. Thank you, Greg. It's a great pleasure. Um, Mike, you've been an acclaimed singer-songwriter for over five decades now. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, if you hadn't become a songwriter, singer-songwriter, what were the options back then? What might have you become? Uh, I probably would have become a lawyer, actually. Um, I have two brothers who are very eminent lawyers, um, one of whom is the just retired Justice Peter McClellan, who ran the Royal Commission into Child Abuse. Um, and the other is the past chairman of um, a company in Australia called Freehills, which is now known as um, Herbert Smith Freehills, one of the biggest legal firms in Australia, actually. So I probably would have gone down that route. In fact, my father was um, rather disappointed when I didn't continue with a law degree. <laughs> So hopefully that legal now, uh, you haven't had to use that over the years. Uh, no, but it's 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 become valuable at times, particularly um, when looking at you know recording or publishing or um, marketing contracts of one form or another. Um, and um, I spent a long time um, in the advertising industry as well after I quit touring in the. Uh, uh, early to mid 80s and you know, running a business um, you do need to be fairly conversant with the nature of contracts when you've got clients with whom you are uh, securing a relationship over the course of maybe three years or so so um, to some extent some of that was valuable um, but in the end I probably could never have seen myself being a, a black little lawyer sitting at a desk looking at contracts all my life. If I'd ever gone down that route, I probably would have gone down the route of being a barrister rather than being a solicitor. Yeah. So when you look back at your career, what do you consider to be some of your career highlights? What are your strongest memories? <clears throat> um, without any shadow of a doubt, the the most valuable memory for me and the most important initially was the success of Song and Dance Man back in 1974. Um, that enabled me to quit teaching. Um, I'd been teaching guitar for a couple of years while I was recording that album, uh, which then, of course, I had to give away simply because I just wasn't going to be home. I was, um, I was traveling and touring and playing concerts. Um, my first real break, though, came when I won New Faces in 1969 for Channel 9. That got me contact with the industry. It got me my first recording contract. Um, and whilst it wasn't necessarily the sort of music that I was uh, performing and trying to write, it gave me huge experience in the television and recording industry. And it gave me exposure to an environment that I subsequently began to then explore uh, after I left the television show. So that was really important in that regard. And, um, and I guess thereafter, of course, uh, the capacity to go on playing concerts and touring um, was propelled by the television series I subsequently did for the ABC in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, so they were the three really significant points in my early career that gave me the opportunity to um, live off and explore what music I was uh, capable of writing and performing at the time. Yeah. In general, what's the starting point for a Mike McLennan song? Um, oh, golly. <laughs> it, it starts in a number of different ways. I firstly have to be, in one way or another, emotionally engaged with what I'm writing about. Um, I've tended to write from a quite personal perspective, but that personal perspective I've used as a means of getting into a topic or a subject in one way or another. Um, it will often start with a, a lyric idea or a hook line. Uh, uh, and there are, a, there are a lot of songwriters I know, and I've done it occasionally myself, who keep a list of titles for songs and they'll go back to their list and think, okay, now it's time to expand what that title was about. Because almost invariably, a good title will be a summation of what it is that you're going to write about. You might not have um, 
expanded the idea, but the germ of the idea is there. And that germ then becomes something which you can work at and develop. Sometimes I've had a, a hook line with a melody. Sometimes I've had a melody with no lyrics, which is um, fairly rare for me, actually. Uh, but generally speaking, we'll start with a lyric idea um, and then I'll sit down and work my way through developing it. Sometimes it just goes nowhere. Sometimes you get halfway through it and you think this isn't working, so I'll discard that and I'll go back to another idea. But I, I'm one of those writers that worries at a song. Uh, I spend a lot of time getting to the point where I'm really happy with the way the melody and the lyrics have come together. So I'm I'm not I'm not a quick writer, although there are occasions when songs will come quickly. But generally, I'll take some time to get them developed to the point where I'm really happy with them. Yeah. Do you agonise over a word or a phrase for a long time? Oh, I have. <laughs> I have in the past, yes. Um, largely because one of the things that uh, drove me when I was very young was a fascination with words. I've always loved words. Um, I read fairly widely um, and I've, I've been a great absorber of poetry. Uh, and I've always loved writers who've had something um, really interesting or perhaps um, opening up a subject in a way in which I had not expected lyrically. Um, I've always loved the music and the lyrics in particular of Leonard Cohen. Uh, as indeed of a lot of other people, of course. Um, and whilst I didn't always fully understand them, I was fascinated by what Bob Dylan was writing. So for me, as a, as a young kid who started out exploring writing and, and loving poetry and loving good literature, um, a good lyric is really, really important. So I do spend a lot of time working my way through lyrics. Yeah. Do you find that you have comfort chords, chords that you gravitate to naturally? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes, although one of the things I've tried to do over my life as a writer is expand my melodic palette so that I uh, avoid, if I possibly can, being too repetitive melodically and chordally. Um, and when I was writing for uh, the advertising industry and for um, some documentary music that I did and basically writing to a brief for those years when I was uh, running an advertising agency or freelancing as a, as a writer, um, that always pushed me into exploring other ways to go melodically because um, sometimes I'd get a brief from a client and say, oh, can we have something that sounds like Steely Dan or sounds like uh, Rod Stewart or sounds like whomever was the, the featured artist of the day? So I'd go and look for the way in which uh, they developed melodies and they created um, songs and use that as inspiration to expand what I was doing. So there's always that sense as a songwriter, at least for me, of constantly exploring what what I can achieve and how I can uh, create um, interesting new ideas. And then, of course, how I can also work within what are quite conventional structures, but make them more interesting. It's always fascinated me, for instance, that some of the great um, Nashville songwriters would work with no more than four or five chords and the same four or five chords regularly, and yet would find ways to be melodically inventive with a very, very small musical palette behind them. And that to me was always the mark of a great writer. I mean, I've loved the music of, for instance, Jimmy Webb. And Jim has this extraordinary capacity to wed a wonderful, at times quite simple melody to the most beautiful chordal structures going on behind it. And I've always loved that. And I've always felt that um, if I was ever to finally achieve that sort of complexity and yet simplicity of melody, that I would, uh, I could regard myself as a good songwriter. And I'm still trying to write a great song. I haven't got there yet, but I'm still working on it. How do you know when a song is finished? 
Oh, gee, that's a good question. Um, sometimes you never, ever quite get to the point where you think a song is really finished. Um, I've never forgotten uh, a comment made by, I think, the late great um, songwriter Hammerstein, who wrote with Richard Rogers, of course. There was a song of his for which he had always said, I'm going to find a better last line for that song. It was used in a, a musical and he swore he'd find a better line and he never did. <laughs> he admitted it right through his life that he never found a better way, but he always knew that he wasn't that happy with the last line. And there's some songs of mine that I've gone, gee, I probably didn't spend enough time really perfecting that one. Um, I got close, but never quite there. And then there are occasions where you think, gee, I wish I'd found a better way to make that melodically work into the bridge or make a better melody of the bridge. But you get to the point where you say, okay, it's pretty good. And it's probably time to leave it alone, record it, or perhaps perform it. And sometimes you never quite know until you get out there on stage and you sing it as to whether or not it's any good. Um, and that can be very revealing, actually. Um, there are times when I've got up on stage and done a new song for the first time, quite apprehensive as to whether or not it will actually really get a good response. And it's not until you get that feedback that you start to realise, yeah, maybe it's not a bad song. And even if I had reservations about it, I'll leave it because the audience liked it. So, you know, I... And, and and as a writer, you never, ever think that you've got to perfection ever um, because in so many ways, that's what drives you to, to continue to write, that sense that maybe there's a better one coming. Yeah. Uh, you've got a great new album called Behind Every Mask. Um, Behind Every Mask is not a song title from the album. It's a, a lyric from the opening track, If Sorrow Should... Yep. Find you, why was that line worthy of the album title? Ah, that's a good question too, because that song, um, If Sorrow Should Find You, was written before we were hit with COVID. Um, and I'd written that line, uh, which says, if you search through your past, you'll find every mask hides questions you'll ask and repeat was written using masks in a very, uh, a very broad sense, not in the literal sense in which we've come to understand what a mask is while we've all been dealing with COVID. And it was written uh, to suggest that in so many ways, we all at some time or another wear a mask. We all at some time or another conceal what's really going on uh, behind the facade. And it, uh, it then became, obviously enough, um, very apparent as I started to record the album that we were all in one way or another dealing with masks and in particular, we were dealing with the reality of having to wear one. And it always had seemed to me that given what we were living through, the title of the album should make some reference to what that song was about because whilst it was prompted by um, the tragic loss of a very dear friend and uh, who left behind a wife and, um, and two small children, um, it was written to say, despite what you might be going through, despite the sorrow and distress and the loss, Love is a, a very healing emotion, and ultimately, uh, you should find love again, as we all do to some extent. And I have a daughter who went through um, the breakdown of a relationship, which she was um, hugely uh, invested in. And she was really distressed when her then partner walked away from the relationship. And to some extent, it was uh, what she was going through that also prompted uh, that song. So 
Um, whilst, as I said, it was written well before COVID, uh, it seemed like uh, such an appropriate way to go to title the album because so much of the album was then subsequently uh, created around that sense of the things that we are all in one way or another dealing with, but have become uh, perhaps even heightened by the struggles we've had with COVID. Yeah. Uh, Letter to America is another great song, an interesting song. Why did you feel the need to write that song? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Obviously enough, it was generated by what I saw America going through when they um, elected Trump. Um, and it distressed me to see what has happened to politics in America and the very, very dramatic divide between uh, the left and the right in America, and also the dramatic divide between those with wealth and those without it. Um, that gulf has become enormous in America and is really one of the reasons why so much of American politics is now so fraught with uh, such a level of angst. Um, and I'd grown up, like a lot of songwriters, uh, very influenced by the works of so many of America's great songwriters and so much of America's literature and creative arts. Um, I'd, I'd studied um, American politics at, un at the university in American history. Um, I'd read widely. I was fascinated by the works of um, John Steinbeck um, and uh, the writing of the great American songwriters, Bob Dylan in particular. And um, to see so much of that work being, if not belittled, at least ignored, and so much of the promise that had been America for so many of us, so uh, destroyed almost over the course of the last five or six years, that I felt compelled to, to make some sort of statement about what I was feeling. Um, and of course, the, um, the, the other fascinating part of that song is that I'd written all the lyrics before I had a melody for it. And it was written just as simply as almost as a piece of poetry, um, knowing that at some point I'd probably try and put it to music. And in doing so, I used the last two lines of one of Bob Dylan's great songs, um, a song called... Um, uh, it's not dark yet. And the last two lines of um, his wonderful song in each of the verses is it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. And um, uh, when I'd written those last two lines and used them as the last two lines of my song, I thought, oh, gosh, I, I probably ought to go and get some um, permission before I, <laughs> before I use Bob's lines. Uh, and I thought, well, that'll probably be difficult because I know how closely guarded his catalogue is. So I sent a note down to um, the, uh, the publishing representatives in Australia and said, um, you know, can you organise for me to uh, get permission? They sent me back um, a three or four page application, which they said will take probably eight weeks to get a response. And it's probably unlikely you're going to get permission to use it anyway. So I thought, oh, well, I'll change it. And then um, it occurred to me that um, my, um, my friend Danny O'Keefe, who's a, a wonderful American songwriter and whom I toured with and did concerts with and who stayed with me when he came out on several occasions to Australia, um, had a co-write with Bob Dylan. So I sent a note to Danny and said, mate, have you got a contact that might help me seek permission? And he wrote back an email and gave me Jeff Rosen's email address. And Jeff is Bob's manager. And he said, look, mate, here's Jeff Rosen's address. He's, he's a great guy, um, but it's highly unlikely you'll get permission. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a crack. So I sent the lyrics. I had no melody to Jeff. And within an hour of sending him an email, I get a note back from Jeff saying, hey, Mike, go for it, <laughs> which blew me away. Um, I, it was just extraordinary. And, and after all of the, um, the hesitancy that I'd experienced from others, he said, oh, it's probably not possible. Um, to get a response inside an hour from Jeff was pretty remarkable, actually. So, um, of course, um, the publishers that represent him in Australia wanted proof 
that I'd actually got permission. So I sent them a copy of Jeff Seymour. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, the songs on this album are given an additional emotional boost by the fabulous arrangements, uh, the orchestral arrangements in the background, which are quite subtle. Uh, did you write those arrangements or was that Matt Fell, the producer? That's mostly Matt. Um, he and I have now done three albums together. He's a, he's a wonderful um, producer. And I suspect too that a lot of the stuff that I've written for this album presented him with some interesting challenges, particularly something like a Letter to America, because it's, it, it, to some extent, a lot of my stuff is um, sort of left field compared to what he would normally do. Um, he's probably the most credentialed uh, country music producer in the country at the moment. He's got, he's got some huge accolades for some wonderful work he's done with a lot of people. Um, my stuff in so many ways sits outside of what you would call country music. It doesn't sit inside pop music. It's somewhere in between, as I've often said of myself, I'm, I take uh, influences from a vast range of music that I've listened to over all my life. And um, so the, the, the variety of, of musical accompaniment to this album, was a process of exploration to some extent for Matt, but he's very clever at it. And in many instances um, on this album, I don't play. Um, and I've always said to him right from the very beginning when we did the first album together, it's not about my playing, it's about the song. It's not, a, it's not about me necessarily having to play on everything. It's to a large extent about making certain that we do full justice to the song. And that's what he's very good at. Um, there are several songs um, where when I will do them on stage, I will do them rather differently to the way in which they're recorded, simply because most of my work is solo. Most of my concerts just me and the guitar. So therefore there's a, in some ways, there's a necessity to, um, create a slightly different musical environment when I do them on stage compared to what we've done when we recorded them. Um, and, um, yeah, bless him, he, he's, he brings something to my music that often I don't hear at first. And that's, that's a huge thrill for me as a, as a writer and performer. And, of course, I've been a producer um, for a number of years myself, doing a lot of music where I've just pulled in players to come and do something for me. Um, to have someone bring something to what I've written that I had not expected is a real thrill. And I love that sense of contribution that other musicians can make to what I've written. Yeah. What is your main songwriting guitar at the moment? Um, I, I have, I'm very blessed actually. I have three guitars that were made for me by the late Brian de Grucci. Um, and uh, the, the reason I have them, and, I, and I'm using three on stage these days, is because I've written um, frequently in different tunings. Um, influenced to some extent by Joni Mitchell, who used a huge variety of tunings in her music. Um, and it gave me a, a, a palette that conventional tuning doesn't necessarily give you. So... I've, I've explored alternative tunings with my three guitars and I've written and used each of them to prompt the way in which I've written a song. My main guitar is still the one that Brian first made for me back in 93. Um, and they're all glorious instruments, but they all sound different. They all have a, a different voice. And I find that fascinating. And when I've put um, two of them in particular, which I tend to use in different tunings in comparison to the first guitar he made, um, I find that that leads me in different directions. So I'll use, all, I'll use all three. And, of course, there are times when I don't use a guitar at all. I'll simply walk around with a, a melody going through my head and then go to a guitar and work out what it 
it should do to accompany the song and what chords should fit behind what I've got happening. Yeah. Well, what's left for Mike McClellan to achieve? Any bucket list projects still on your mind? <laughs> <laughs> oh, when I did the last album called No Intermission, I thought, well, that'll be the last one. I, I probably won't do anymore. But, Greg, I'm a writer. And um, I, I once saw a comment by a very, very uh, highly regarded American advertising writer who once said that... Uh, those in advertising who do the administration and manage the relationship between the agency and a client have careers. Writers have lives. And as a writer, for me, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost like a compulsion. Um, I have to write. It's something I love doing. I love the sense of achievement when something really works. I'm in the middle of writing a book on songwriting, um, which is essentially as much for my kids and my grandkids and their kids as it might be for a broader audience in that what I'm doing is using uh, the songs from my own catalogue as a means of demonstrating certain aspects of the creative process. Um, so it, it's, about, it's about my life through the songs that I've written. So... That's one objective, get that finished. I'm probably 50 odd thousand words into a novel, um, which has gone, I've put on one side for the last three or four years while I've finished music and worked my way through my songwriting book. So they're still objectives that I, that I wish to fulfill. Um, I don't think I'll do another full studio album but I may actually go into the studio and do just a solo acoustic guitar album, repeat some of my past songs, but I've got a few songs that I've been writing in the course of the last uh, 12 months that I didn't record for this new album. And uh, I might do those just solo as well. Um, you know, I mean, for someone like me at my age, and I'm 76 now, um, to... Uh, to try and sell albums uh, is, is difficult. Um, there's not a lot of return for someone like me, other than perhaps what I can sell at concerts. And I'm, I'm in so many ways, Greg, I'm still very fortunate that I'm playing well, I'm singing as well as I've ever sung, actually. Um, and I'm very, very happy with the vocals on this album. Uh, I've even leapt into falsetto on some occasions, which was something I've never done to any extent on past albums and it works um, so you know I, I'm still exploring I'm I'm still fascinated by the process um, and I'm fit and well enough to continue to do it um, which I'm actually very grateful for I've got friends in the music industry who can no longer play because arthritis has struck them badly um, or alternatively their voices are failing them and um, they've lost a lot of impetus. My old mate, Doug Ashdown, for instance, doesn't do any more performing. Um, he's still playing a bit at home, but he's not singing. Um, uh, a wonderful friend, Al Ward, has not been able to play for uh, a long time, um, unfortunately, suffering badly from arthritis. And, you know, I look around me and I'm, I'm losing friends at, at this stage in my life. Um, and I'm, uh, I consider myself extremely lucky. So there are still challenges. And of course, you know, at my age, um, it's the challenges and the, the continuing pursuit of those things that keeps me alive and active and, in, and fully engaged and, you know, keeps me healthy too. Yeah. Well, Mike, uh, Behind Every Mask is a wonderful album. It's out now. And thanks for joining us. Mate, Greg, it's been a great pleasure. And thank you very much. Cheers.